Hey people, just Siobhan here quickly jumping in at the start of the show to remind you that we have a new sponsor and that is the Animal Public's book series which is part of the University of Sydney Press. So the wise people at the University of Sydney have decided to have an animal studies focused series. It's called Animal Publics. It has fantastic series editors in Fiona Probin Rapsi and Melissa Boyd. It is the hot place to publish your animal studies work and also a good place to go and look if you want to stock up on animal studies publications for your institution. So check out Animal Publics, part of the University of Sydney Press. This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars and animal advocates about their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ESA. ESA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Have you joined ESA? I've been telling you week in, week out that you should join ESA. If you've not joined, I'm going to take it as a personal affront to me. Think about joining ESA. They do a lot of work to support animal studies scholars, but they also need your support. They need you to become a member so they can be strong and so they can have funds. Membership is very affordable and people can join from all around the world. So that's ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Well, once again, this episode of Knowing Animals is coming to you from Christchurch in New Zealand, where I'm attending the fantastic 2019 ASA conference, which is called Decolonising Animals. And again, I'm joined by another guest who is someone who I wouldn't normally have the opportunity to speak to. It's also someone whose paper I very much enjoyed when I saw it a couple of days ago. So this week I'm joined by Catherine Amy. Now, Catherine has quite a few different hats. She's an independent scholar. She's a librarian. She's also an animal advocate and she has her own sanctuary. Oh, she's going to correct me in a second. That's okay, we can get, she works at her own sanctuary or she volunteers at a sanctuary. She's nodding now, she volunteers at a sanctuary. But nevertheless, Catherine is from New Zealand and she has written a book called The The Compassionate Contrarians, A History of Vegetarianism in Aora. I did not know, how do I pronounce that? Aotearoa. Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it was published by Rebel Press in 2014. Welcome to the podcast, Catherine. Kia ora, Siobhan. I'm really happy to be here. Kia ora, yes. Catherine also did our beautiful uh, Maori welcome at our session. Catherine, why did you write this book? Ah, that's a really, really good question. And it goes back a long way, I would say. As well as being involved with animal rights, I've also been involved a bit with the peace movement. Probably one of my proud moments is being arrested for sitting in front of a tank years and years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So I've also been interested in studying and reading about the peace movement. And yeah, I was reading quite an amazing book by David Grant called Out in the Cold, which is about conscientious objectors during the Second World War. And in the sort of flow up to it, they mentioned this interesting person named Norman Bell, who was a socialist and anti-war activist who'd been in prison for his beliefs. And they said he was also a vegetarian and animal rights activist and seemed, yeah, quite ahead of his time. So I thought, wow, that sounds like an interesting person. And yeah, as it happened, he also lived here in Christchurch. And so I looked a little bit more about him and found that he was, yeah, yeah, he was this really staunch vegan. He was into decolonization. He campaigned for independence for India and Samoa. And I thought, this sounds like an interesting person. And then I discovered more interesting vegetarians who were also involved in peace movement, feminism, 
year of decolonization and I thought, well, I just really want to find those stories and make them accessible to people because if I'm finding them inspiring, other people will too. And yeah, and perhaps we can learn from things today. Yeah, and the other th- another thing was really interesting to me is that New Zealand since the mid-19th century has got such a history of animal exploitation that meat and dairy are so key to our economy and, and culture and the sort of idea you can't really be a real New Zealander unless you eat meat. And yeah, it's sort of, when you get way back, you had all these people who were challenging that paradigm. And yeah, I thought that was really interesting to unpack that a little bit. Yeah, so you've done a lot of archival research and you've you've dug up their stories so as you say this is all happening within the context of very much a dairy focused and meat focused country but can you take us back to perhaps um the Maori connection with vegetarianism. You found out something about Maoris and vegetarianism? Yeah, yeah, that was really interesting because I had some friends involved with Tuhoi, particularly sort of um, Maori iwi on the East Coast, and there was one interesting story that emerged from Ngati Awa, and I contacted them and checked they were okay for me to retell that story, about an ancestor, Toi Kairako, who was one of the original ancestors who came to Aotearoa, and that was translated as the meaning toy the vegetarian. And yeah, and I thought that was quite interesting. Someone who was like, who ate forest food, so it were foraged rather than hunted. And I mean, I don't know that necessarily means that people were ever actually vegetarian, but there was this idea of vegetarianism within the culture. Yeah, and... And there were some writings from the 19th century that indicated a vegetarian diet was used to treat certain diseases such as leprosy and fevers. So, yeah, it was interesting. The idea was was definitely there. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to uncover that. Yeah, Yeah. there's a great inclusion in the book. But, of course, a lot of it has to do with... uh, colonial settlers and their approach to vegetarianism. So can you take us back to where the kind of the story starts? Where do you see vegetarianism starting to emerge in New Zealand? Yes, yeah. I mean, definitely Western vegetarianism came with the first settlers. The first person I really came across was Mary Richmond, who arrived in Taranaki in the 1850s. And yeah, yeah. And she sort of saw the realities of animal exploitation and decided to become a vegetarian, which was a very difficult thing at that time. And yeah, yeah. And she, and yeah, there were all these letters from her family, both sort of here in New Zealand and back in England, who were saying, you know, how ridiculous it was to be vegetarian, that it was, yeah, it was actually also challenging the Christian paradigm because God had created animals for us to eat them. And if you were not eating animals, you were not really being Christian. Yeah, and so there was this basically this concerted campaign for her to start eating meat again. And then particularly when she became pregnant, then that was like you, even if you're yourself, you're not eating meat, then you have to eat meat for the child. And in the event, she did sort of cave in a little bit and agreed to eat a little bit of meat when she was pregnant. So, yeah, and I just felt quite sorry for her that she had everything, the whole world, against her really. And But you also found examples of women coming together, joining together to talk about progressive issues, including uh, vegetarianism. And in the session that we had at the conference a few days ago, you had that beautiful photo of the meeting of the first, you know, vegetarian society and the women are all dressed in that very Victorian garb. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, yes. That was actually the first meeting of the National Council of Women in the 1890s. So they wouldn't have all been vegetarian, but they were certainly discussing vegetarianism and animal rights and anti-vivisection in particular. And as a body, they affiliated with the yeah, Vegetarian Society in Britain, which was, yeah, quite interesting. And, yeah, and like at the conferences, you know, I've looked through all the proceedings and they were attached there discussing all these exciting topics. And as I mentioned on Tuesday, like wages for housework, living communally, ab- abolishing capital punishment, prison reform. Yeah, it was really quite an exciting time. And And did you find throughout your research that a lot of the progressive 
thinkers on vegetarianism were also progressive on other issues. Did you find that a lot of these went hand in hand? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there were yeah, quite a lot of women in particular who are active in the feminist movement and also exploring vegetarianism and animal rights. And yeah, and as I think I mean, it's part of that too was because at the time, you know, it was women's role to cook and you there weren't a lot of cooking appliances, you had coal stoves and yeah, and vegetarian was also a way to liberate yourself a bit from the kitchen because if you were doing mostly raw food that was easy to prepare, that was vegetarian, you weren't actually having to be over the hot stove and clean those pans full of fat. Which, and of course there was also quite a lot of a link with the temperance movement which was actually a little bit more radical back then I would say because yeah, they saw temp yeah that alcohol was such a cause of domestic violence and if you could that stop that you could stop violence yeah towards women and children and yeah and that there's a feeling that eating meat when we went was drinking alcohol and so that if you didn't eat meat and you were thinking about your lifestyle then that sort of yeah that was a way towards making the lives of women and children better and also there was the general feeling that, uh, yeah, oppression was wrong and a few, yeah, animals did have lives that had significance and value. And there was huge suffering that was probably more visible to people back then. It wasn't quite so sanitised. You went to the butcher shop and you saw half the animal hanging up there. So it was, yeah, it was visible. And there was certainly, it, it was feeling like it wasn't just one thing. It was a whole lot of reasons to go vegetarian. Wonderful. And so then moving more towards the contemporary vegetarian scene in New Zealand and then I guess perhaps also the vegan scene at some stage, what were some of the things that you uncovered or discussed in your book? Yeah, certainly towards moving towards the 60s and 70s with the counterculture movement. There was a lot of interest in vegetarianism then and the links between vegetarians and environmentalism, the concern about global hunger and the fact that if you... Yeah, if you had a vegetarian diet, that meant there was enough food for everyone. And also animal rights too, obviously, in the 70s. You had yeah, Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, which was an influential book. And also Francis Moore Lappe's Diet for a Small Planet, which came, yeah, came out around the end. And the first works about factory farming. And yeah, Ruth Avis's book about animal machines. Yeah, these were all influencing people. And yeah, yeah, and you had the sort of more modern animal rights groups emerging. I'd like to mention Betty Rowe of Arapawa Island, who, yeah, yeah, in the 70s, she sort of moved here from America. They became sheep farmers. And then she really connected with the wild goats there. And there was a campaign by the authorities to kill the goats as yeah, imported pests and she the goats and the campaign to save them and then she thought why am I also eating why am I eating other animals while I'm campaigning to save these goats and yeah and she was also exploring the feminist movement at the time so and she had discussions with her husband and then she took off her wedding room and ring and moved to the other end of the island and became vegetarian and yeah, and then he actually said, you win, I'm going to join you, and they ran a goat sanctuary, and they also had their first animal rights conference in the, yeah, in the late 70s, oh, out of wow. Island, and there's this lovely story about how all these activists came, and they had to get there by boat, and that dolphins accompanied them on their way to the first animal rights conference. Wonderful. So then bring us into the, I guess, the present day, I find that vegan cuisine is plentiful. You know, I've been to Christchurch and also Wellington uh, in recent years and there's certainly no shortage of vegan cuisine. What would you say about, the, say, the vegan scene in New Zealand at the present day? Yeah, yeah, obviously it's very encouraging. There's a lot more options. I do have a little bit of a concern that sometimes it can, yeah, feel like... It's a little bit single issue, you can eat your vegan food, you can only talk to vegans and you're not always that aware of other issues the way people were a hundred years ago, which I, yeah, that does So we've lost me. something? Yeah, yeah, and I, 
just sort of hope that we can sort of look to that more intersectional approach and just realise that, you know, that capitalism and animal exploits are so linked and you can't really just be a kind, nice little participant in vegan capitalism. One thing I found really interesting is that the countries which the highest proportion of vegans also have the highest meat consumption and, yeah, there's also a bit of a level of privilege in that, that you've got the choices to what you eat and you can be a vegan choice, but there's also vast numbers of animals being slaughtered so so what how would you like to see veganism say evolve in New Zealand in the future what would your ideal be yeah yeah that again that's really interesting I know to be part of a global context I do see the sort of meat alternatives the fake meat the um, possible burger is having an impact again that's again within capitalism and I sort of in concern that within New Zealand we might end up being these kind of niche meat producers. I think we do need to work with other movements. There's been some really good work happening with direct animal action up in Auckland and Northland, working with local marae and communities to oppose yeah, a, chicken, a vast chicken farm, which, and I think that's a model to go with. It's quite interesting, in the 80s there were actually a campaign against live exports that involved both slaughterhouse workers and animal rights activists. And I think looking for some challenging relationships can be, can be really useful, that we need to yeah, broaden our sphere of concern if we are going to be able to make progress. Wonderful. Well, Catherine, your book is available actually online and also via the library and can also be purchased. So for anyone who wants to learn more about the history of vegetarianism in New Zealand, I really recommend the book to you very highly. And it's very, very, um, very, very detailed um, archival work has clearly gone into it. And you also write very beautifully. Now, Catherine, I ask everyone who comes on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Yeah, yeah. Now, you might be aware that there's an, a kind of a scholarly version and a protecting animals version. Now, you're both, you're both an independent scholar and also a, an animal advocate. Now, I'm going to go with the scholarly version, but if you want to answer them from an animal activist perspective, that's also absolutely fine. We can be very flexible with our five quick questions. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Uh, that's really interesting because initially I thought Peter Singer, an Liberation, but I actually realised I read Francis Moore Lapis, he had died for a small planet before then, and that certainly influenced me. It put me in that general space of thinking about vegetarianism and animals. Yeah, and, yeah right. And the environmental impact. Yeah, yeah, consumption. I remember that book very well also. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Okay, yeah. Well, I wrote a book before The Compassionate Contrarians called Clean, Green and Cruelty-Free with a question mark about the real story of animals in Aotearoa, which was basically a compilation of all the different research about animal exploitation in New Zealand. It was, yeah, it was before we had so many internet resources, it was so that activists could have a, like, one place to go to to bring facts and figures and also to inform myself more. But, yeah. It's been out there a bit and, yeah, I think people have found it useful. Oh, Just great. Uh, Wonderful. So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Um, actually, someone who's here at the conference today. I've just been amazed by Patrice Jones. I've, yeah, got her book, The Oxen at the Intersection, which is a wonderful book. I really recommend that you read it. And I've, yeah, watched quite a lot of her webinars. This is the first time I've ever heard her speak, and it was as amazing as I thought it would be. And she's just got such a clear vision of the complexities of the area in which we work and the links between colonisation and, yeah, and all, the, all forms of exploitation. I yeah. Really yeah, Patrice has been a guest on the show and she also delivered the 2019 Val Plumwood Memorial Lecture, so a great honour for her and she did a wonderful job. So... Um, the, the question, the next question is, what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? But because you're an independent scholar, maybe we'll say, what's the most important thing, say, researchers and thinkers and writers can do for animals? Yeah, that's a really 
Again, it's a really good question, and it's going to depend a little bit on how you're positioned, I think, what your field of expertise and interest is. I think to make your yeah, animal voices visible and to think broadly is probably what I would say. I mean, you've got all the usual things about you know, becoming vegan, supporting animal advocacy causes. To me, I just sort of tend to try and look at what, where the movement is at and see what is the most useful thing I can do and where that intersects where I've got a passion for. Mm. Right. Sounds very, yeah. very smart approach. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Yeah, interesting. Um, yes, I'm not, even though I'm not a huge fan, fan of Gary Francione, I think I would say abolishing the property relationship with animals. I really think that is pretty key because one of the conundrums what sort of I think about is the whole sort of indigenous peoples and traditional use of animals and as a non-indigenous person I don't really feel very comfortable com commenting on that space. I know there's work done by indigenous activists but I feel that animals as property is quite alien to that paradigm and so yeah so that's a first step that we can take that I think yeah I feel very comfortable with. Wonderful well what are you working on next? Ah uh, again good question I have had thoughts of doing an, a, a biography of Norman Bell who's one of the people I'm fascinated by and I'm also sort of hoping to update a little bit my work sort of on animal abuse and old turtle. Yeah, the resource I originally did and maybe doing it in a more interactive form as a website. Right. And I've also got some Wikipedia articles I'm planning on writing because, yeah, that's a very used source. That's yeah. what I think it would be really good to Oh, good. So you're keeping busy. There. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and how can people find out more about your work? Okay, there's the Rebel Press website, obviously, and yeah, just send me an email, I guess. <laughs> send you an email? Do you yeah. want to give people your email yeah. address? Yeah, yeah, I'll give you the one that's easy to remember, and that's lentilplanet at gmail.com. Oh, okay, lentilplanet, I think people will remember that. Mm. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, a podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars and animal advocates about their work. Now, you can find us easily online at Twitter at knowing underscore animals or at Facebook, also at Knowing Animals. Finally, don't forget to leave a review on iTunes because reviews make it easier for other people to find us and learn about the good work we're trying to do for animals. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.